talking about May Turner syndrome one why how to treat in eight minutes is pretty tricky. So hopefully I'll cover some of that. Luckily, Mahmoud just talked a little bit about uh, the the when and the and the why. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the how. Um, Kind of when I think, talk to people and they ask me about May Thurner stenting, you know, I think the goal would be long-term patency, right? We're putting in a lot of stents in people and some people are failing and the question is why? So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to make sure that you get accurate stent placement proximally, distally. You need to use correct stent sizing. I don't really believe that this oversizing that we've been doing is helping people. We need to correct, choose a correct access site when we're doing iliac venous stenting, make sure we pay attention to the laws of adequate inflow and outflow, and then there's the good clinical management that is important. But most of these patients don't fail due to poor clinical management, but I see a lot of patients being sent to a hematologist to switch the anticoagulation, when the reality is the majority of the time there's an anatomic problem that hasn't been adequately addressed. So if you're gonna just start learning how to do these things more and more in the venous system, um, you need to understand parallax, which is the divergence of the x-ray beam as it comes through the patient. So anything that's on the edges of your screen is not as true in its position as anything in the center of the screen. So you need to center your area of interest. Um, and I mark with venography and intravascular ultrasound. So this is a picture of how I do it. Mark both walls of the inferior vena cava where I think the crossing vessel is venographically, and then I go ahead and confirm that with intravascular ultrasound. So a lot of times the base, the inferior vena cava is a little compressed. We can see where the artery is compressing and stop there. Draw and make sure that you're exactly where you are on your picture before you deploy the stent. This is a situation where you want to you know, measure twice and, and cut once. Because what we're trying to do, I'm sorry, I can't get it to advance. It has to be no red arrow, there we go, is to avoid um, placement of stents that are too short, like in this 20-year-old girl who had stents placed where it didn't even reach the edge of the inferior vena cava and she was severely symptomatic and it's been kind of a lifetime of pain for her. The other thing is that if you're not going to be willing to cross the inguinal ligament and you're going to start stenting iliac venous disease, stop doing it. Because the bottom line is that if you put a stent into an obstructed vessel, it will occlude. It has no other choice. There is no inflow. When you remove your sheath, the stent will occlude. So this is an example of a 30-year-old PACU nurse from an academic institution in the United States who's had 13 procedures by both interventional radiology and vascular surgery, all performed from the groin, including cut downs, including um, fistulas, putting her into right heart failure, all with severe symptoms for what was originally simply a left iliac vein occlusion, and now she has bilateral iliac vein IVC occlusion and it um, took me seven and a half hours to fix that, so I'm getting like a little bit passionate about the fact that if you're not gonna be willing to go down to a place of flow, you shouldn't take on those cases. There's an argument that bigger is better and that every iliac should be at least 16 millimeters. I don't think stents should be oversized in the venous system when it's a non-thrombotic vessel. The vein walls are very thin. It's very different from the arteries. Um, this leads to chronic organizing thrombus inside the stents because um, the body wants to make the stent the right size to follow Murray's law. So Murray's law defines uh, efficiency of flow. It's just like gravity. It's not really arguable. And it is a constant in arteries, branching vessels, xylem in plants, bronchi. It hasn't been validated in veins, but it has been validated in the arteries. And what this says is that the cube root of the radius of the parent vessel equals the sum of the cube root of the radius of the daughter vessels, which to me meant absolutely nothing every time I heard that in a talk. So if we look at what that really means, what that means is that if you measure the size of the inferior vena cava and you understand what size this patient is, then you can understand what size their iliac veins should be. And so if the patient has an IVC that's 16, 20 millimeters, then their, then their iliacs should be 16. But if the patient has an 18 millimeter cava, we should not be putting 18 millimeter stents in the iliac veins. The access site is critically important. I hear more and more about people talking about accessing the groin and the saphenous, which is fine in non-thrombotic May Thurner, but you have patients with DVT, you absolutely must access below the level of disease if you're gonna be able to reestablish inflow into stents and keep them open. This is an example of the same patient with an ejection with the sheath in the mid-thigh on the left 
and the sheath advanced into the pelvis on the right. Now, it's, there's also up and over, so it's a dual injection there, but that's the same patient five seconds apart. If you have your sheath up in the pelvis and you think that you've restored flow and it looks good, if you can't pull that sheath back down below where the next point of pop-off is or collateral, you can't show that you're gonna have flow and those will occlude. Um, if you stent into the pelvis, this is very controversial, but chronic femoral popliteal DVD is more important than any of us understand. And if you stent in the pelvis a 50% stenosis and you've convinced yourself that you've opened the deep venous system and it's now safe to ablate the saphenous veins, but the patient has severe femoral popliteal DVT, what happens is what happened to this gentleman, which is severe wounds, non-healing for five years. This man was suicidal. And femoral popliteal recanalization, this patient's wounds are healed in a month. So I think we need to pay attention to the inflow as much as we do the outflow when we decide to do the celiac venous stenting. So I'm gonna run through one case really quickly here too. I think the anatomy is really important. This is a 44-year-old female with a history of uh, 10 years of pelvic pain, groin pain, dyspareunia, urinary frequency, and urgency. And in the pelvic pain patients, I like to use CT to help me understand what's happening with the gonadal veins. In this patient, the gonadal veins are massively enlarged, but there's not a significant amount of reflux in either one on the CT. And as we follow this down, we can see that there's a Mathern or defect that is very severe that in the past may have been missed because the patient um, has huge gonadals. There are no dilated veins around the ovaries in this patient, which is where the gonadals usually go. But down deep in the pelvis, there are massively dilated varices that explain this patient's urinary urgency, frequency, dyspareunia, and pelvic pain. So in this patient, when we do a venogram, I like to go down to the mid-thigh so you can see where the flow is and you're not pressurizing a system. And you can see she flows retrograde into the internal iliacs, fills all those varices with paralumbar collaterals. And this patient's problem is a Mayferner and not gonadal vein reflux. So the actual size of the gonadal veins is not what's important. What's important is the symptom complex and figuring out what the cause of this patient's problem is. And when we do an IVUS on her, she had near complete occlusion um, of her iliac vein. And we can see clear collateralization and then resolution of that after stenting. So if we want to talk about Mathern or stenting, I think you really need to understand exactly how to place these stents correctly, how to not jail the other side, how to put it just past with the newer stents that are stronger. We don't need to go into the inferior vena cava as much. We're going to be able to match the size of the veins. And that's what's going to lead to long-term patency far more than just managing the medical management. Because even if you didn't put them on any anticoagulation, a lot of these patients would do just fine if the case is done correctly.